In this next section of the presentation on transitions, we're going to take a look at the different grade spans and configurations of buildings in the Pittsburgh Public Schools and how transitions differ between them and how uh, successful transitions can be built to move students between them. So we look at this in terms of four transitional areas. Early care and education is a preschool uh, level and in the um, KTO grant and in, in the uh, comprehensive literacy plan we talk about birth through 12. Well this is what we're talking about in this early block. Um, transitions from home care, early care, and then into elementary school. Then of course we would have the transitions that occur within elementary school and then transitions between elementary to middle, transitions that occur within middle school, and then transitions between middle and high. So you have the horizontal transitions happening within the grade span configuration or early care and education, and you have vertical transitions happening between these um, grade spans, but also within as they move up, say, in middle school from 6th to 7th to 8th grade. This portion of the presentation will deal with the middle school configuration and the uh, vertical horizontal transitions and concerns specific to that grade and age level. As we begin thinking about the middle grades, middle schools, or, or the 6-8 grade span in our K-8s or 6-12s, what do we already know about this time in a student's life and the transitions that they're going to experience? So I'd like you to take a moment now to stop and either talk about or jot down and chart some of your ideas and experiences uh, related to the two questions on this slide. What do we as a district and or as a building, your own particular building, already provide in the area of transition support to the middle grade student. Follow that up by asking yourself, does this work for each of your items? Does it work well or should it be changed, improved, or even abandoned because it's just too, taking too many resources and time and it isn't working well enough? The second question is, what specific needs are there in middle school transitions? So what do you see as missing and necessary to add? And then next to each one of these items, why? Why are these important to act upon? Why do these belong in a plan of uh, action for a school or for a district? So the middle school student. Transition into middle school is marked by a lot of changes in educational expectations and, and practices, so a lot in the school process domain. In elementary schools, uh, children are taught in self-contained classrooms generally with a f set of, f of familiar peers who they've become uh, very, f very close to some of, and with a teacher or two, perhaps a couple of teachers for specials who they can count on. Their day is very uh, scheduled and very routine in many cases. But once students reach middle school, they must start to interact with many more peers, more teachers, and with an intensified expectation for both their performance and their level of responsibility. So social, developmental, and academic experiences are all affected, and that requires them, these, this age of, of uh, students, to adjust to what they see as a new setting, new structures, new expectations, new people, new concerns socially. It's a big deal. Some students struggle as they transition to middle school. Others take it naturally. <coughs> Excuse me. But both groups want to know that there's someone looking out for them, someone they can rely on so that they feel safe. A critical piece of this transition is the age and maturity level of the students. It's not all about the process, but also the personal relationships. In elementary school, students relied on their teacher, 
who was a familiar face daily and who guided them and reassured them and comforted them and was basically there for them. A well-designed transition plan in the middle grades can restore, restore the strong sense of belonging that entering middle school students once felt in elementary school or hopefully felt in elementary school. So we see belonging is one of the primary concerns for a new middle level student. Addressing it is crucial for a successful transition. Teachers and administrators should assure students that their classes are a good match for their readiness, that their teachers understand them, and that they have roles to play in their own success. As we move along with this, you might want to pause occasionally and talk about how those things do or don't happen in your particular building. Do students, are they welcomed in a certain way? Are they made to feel that they're part of a family? Are they made to feel that they're part of a group, that they belong there? Do, um, are, are there processes for explaining their placement in certain programs, for instance, in Read 180? I know there can be a lot of turmoil there with a the transition to a, a, a different program than their, some of their peers are taking. What do you do now to ease that transition? And what might be some areas that can be smoothed over? If you continue through this presentation to jot those things down, I think it'll be uh, really helpful to bring back to your uh, team. So along with making sure that there is a system in place to support uh, a sense of belonging for a new middle level student, it's also important to design the classrooms and hallways with the students in mind. And this, of course, goes to school processes and the environment. And you want to make sure that you have a lot of student work prominently displayed. Find ways to help students see themselves and see how they're doing middle school and how they're doing in middle school. For example, the year before they enter, you might want to invite students to shadow a middle school student for half a day. If that's difficult to arrange, um, show rising middle schoolers a day in the life of a middle school student, maybe a video where you've guided uh, current middle school students to create for their incoming class. Let rising middle schoolers discuss middle school life with current middle school students to make new students comfortable. Conduct these conversations in students' elementary classrooms, not at the middle school. In order to create a sense of belonging, in the first few weeks of schools, you might want to consider giving new middle schoolers some meaningful tasks that really foster a sense of belonging such as doing the morning announcements or maintaining and operating uh, some sort of uh, classroom technology, getting, thing, getting something ready in the morning, or even assisting in lesson delivery. This creates purposeful inclusion. Students at this age balk at superficiality and find it distancing, the opposite of belonging. Things that students might balk at might be attempts to make them feel welcome such as putting all the new faces on a bulletin board in the main hall where they didn't get to participate in that or select the photo. Um, it's a false sense of welcome as opposed to welcoming you into the process of what we do at middle school. Clubs and organizations and teams sports are also extremely important if they're available. Uh, so making sure that there are at least clubs and organizations to join that can go a long way in creating a sense of belonging and well-being. Team building activities and participation in outdoor experiences are also um, great ways to make a f students feel not only as if they belong but that they're able and capable. My own daughter is in fifth grade and as a part of their leaving fifth grade and getting ready to go to middle school, each fifth grade uh, class for the last several decades, I believe, has had a ritual of a camping trip where they go for five days 
It was the first five days she was ever away from me. And it's almost as though a rite of passage was created. And because they're doing this with another school, so the two fifth grades that will feed into the same middle school go together, they become bonded on that trip where they are living in tents and going on hikes and doing all kinds of Indian lore exploration and battlefield exploration. The, um, that process has been so successful and so powerful that it has become a big, big tradition and kids who have gone on those trips as fifth graders are now the high school um, camp counselors later on and talk about it as being one of the most important transitions of their life. So consider outside of school as another way of transitioning students into the middle school. If you know a current sixth grader or seventh grader or eighth grader, you know that everything is big. Every day is the end or beginning of all life as they know it. They have huge emotions that transition back and forth at the drop of a hat. And these can be confusing people for adults to empathize with. But given the fact that a year in a middle school student's life is a much larger percentage of his or her overall life than it is for an adult, and given all the growth taking place, the mistakes, conflicts, insights, joy, tension, wisdom, and risk-taking. And given that students lack the perspective that comes from life experience, it's no wonder that students experience their first year of middle school as intense and, and tumultuous, because every day is the end or beginning of all life as they know it. Middle schools with the best transition programs are the ones in which the faculty members are in touch with their inner young adolescent. And we all have colleagues who just seem to get this right and who seem themselves to be big kids, but they understand. They they feel what they can feel what the kid feels rather than trying to talk them out of it or dismissing it or telling them that that's not the way the real world is. That doesn't help um, a middle school student who knows nothing else. So it's extremely important to try to remember what it was like when you were their age. Uh, empathy helps teachers understand students' major worries, and those things can include homework, demanding teachers, bullying, getting lost in a new building. Schools should build practical advice for handling each one of these concerns into their transition programs. It's also important to make sure that you promote empathy with all, through all the adults in the building and that they learn to respond constructively to new students. It's helpful to think of your middle schoolers as having arrived in a new country in which they don't speak the language and don't know the customs. In fact, many strategies that are effective with transitioning new English language learners work equally well with helping incoming middle school students. It's important that people who work in the middle grades have a really clear understanding of the characteristics of this age group ahead of time uh, so that they can interact with them in a supportive way. So you might want to ask yourself if everybody on your faculty um, does know what makes a middle school developmentally appropriate for young adults or young adolescents, sorry because many educators have little or no training in the specific needs of these learners. And this lack of knowledge can limit the success of transition efforts and student learning. So when you plan your transitions, some things you need to consider are how teachers are meeting the physical and mental needs of this age group in the months before and after the first day of school. In the area of physical characteristics, girls mature faster than boys. In both genders, bones grow faster than muscle, so coordination is a big issue. With all the growth comes almost ceaseless appetite. The explosion of hormones coursing through the body causes increased development in sexual features, as well as worry over body changes. And there is an increased need for good hydration and nutrition. 
are these things considered as they transition from elementary to middle school? And then we have their brains to think about. And we all know that those brains are not fully developed. The prefrontal cortex in particular is not fully developed in most 10 to 15 year olds and as a result the navigating tools for academic and life academics and life are not completely online yet. These include decision making, impulse control, moral and abstract reasoning, planning ability, understanding consequences of words and actions, and other executive functions. And there tends to be an increased um, drive toward addiction behaviors and pleasure seeking. So when you think about those things, impulse control, decision making, inability to plan the way they one day will, understanding consequences. If you spent your time in a middle school, this is you know very, very obvious. Do we respond to them as though this is their natural state of being the way they should be? Or do we respond to them as this being um, aberrant behavior, there's something wrong with them? Uh, because those types of approaches can really support or destroy a, a student's transition into the middle grades. They've been very supported in elementary school. If we suddenly in the middle school start looking at them as though they are uncontrollable crazy people, then they're going to start enjoying school less. And I think that we do see that drop in engagement in middle school. And not saying that this is the reason, but it might be a, a participating reason in why we see a drop off in their desire to do well and to feel that they belong. A little bit more about middle schoolers is that they are fiercely curious and independent on the more positive end of the spectrum and yet paradoxically they they really crave social connection. They can make insightful candid observations about their learning about themselves and the adults who guide them. Candid meaning they come right out and say what they're thinking. They realize for the first time how wrong or misinformed adults can be. And this is where we get the this transition from the way they view their elementary teachers to the way they view teachers perhaps from there on. And they're not sh quite sure what to make of it, but they now see that adults can have failings. They move from concrete to abstract thinking. They're becoming more skeptical about some things. For instance, they might say something like, I want the school board to prove to me how knowing algebra will make me a better adult. They can become very challenging because they think that they're seeing things for the first time and they want answers. But they, won't, they, they want everything to be rational, and yet, again, paradoxically, they will complain about ridiculous things like they won't be able to move on in, in their lives if they don't go get a drink of water right now or uh, they have to answer an email right now or, or a text right now and not being allowed to do so is just ridiculous. So they go back and forth when it comes to uh, their, rational, their, their rational selves. And despite their natural egotism, young adults can be extremely compassionate towards those less fortunate. And I know I've seen this on many, many occasions. It's, it does, you, does your heart good. They're also very able to make connections, to see patterns, to understand metaphor and nuance. And they like to ask unanswerable questions. So the question here is, are the people in the staff of a middle school building aware of these things. Because if they're not, through no fault of their own, they may respond in a very off-putting way to a transitioning middle school student. At this point, you might want to pause for some, some discussion and story sharing because it is likely that uh, anybody listening to this is thinking of particular experiences they've had that match some of the descriptions we've just uh, heard. 
Another um, thing that might help transition elementary students into the middle grades is focusing on the positive. So when you consider the developmental level of middle school students, it's really important to make them feel powerful, to empower them. The world excites these kids and they're really eager to explore it and so when they leave elementary school and come into middle school, it's very jarring for them to spend the first weeks of school listening to an endless litany of what they can't do and what's going to happen if they do it. It's, uh, it kind of kills that spirit of them wanting to um, move ahead and do new things in middle school. So with each information session on rules and limitations, a teacher would be um, more supportive to also offer some positives that middle school students can do. Even something as simple as being able to check out 10 books at a time from the library instead of the elementary school limit of maybe two. Because middle, schools, uh, middle schoolers don't want to be seen as so young anymore. They want to see how they're going to be treated differently now that they're middle schoolers. And they want that to be about increased responsibility and increased autonomy. So it's because they still look so young that some teachers make the mistake of thinking that they're less competent than they really are. They may not have experience in everything, but they are quick learners. So showing them how to, for instance, set up accounts on the school server or post their own work or if a teacher would weave in content from multiple classes. That's things that, that these kids are ready for and eager for that excites them that they can do. Having them create their own stylized presentations or participate in wiki groups or you know whatever you can do to give them more access and more autonomy along with guidelines, but they tend to respond better to being allowed to do more. You need to provide opportunities for them to demonstrate responsibility and decision making. Instead, instead I think our tendency is sometimes to try to control them, keep them in a chair, keep them in a seat, and make sure that they're under control. And that can backfire because when they're that a child in the middle ages middle ages, in the middle grades, adolescents are suppressed, they tend to push back. So if they're given opportunities to show that they're responsible and make their own decisions, they will often rise to that uh, freedom and, and surprise you. Some of the things that um, I've seen work in the past with allowing students to take some control and this can be students who are often the ones who are your behavior problems and who are pushing back to being controlled, is to give them, for instance, have them contact uh, a guest speaker that is, is going to be scheduled to come in and, and have them do the first contact and in, in invitation. Put them in adult shoes for a minute. Or have them uh, ask them, uh, you know, which type of practice here best helps you learn this and allow them to choose from different options, which is also a good way to differentiate. Uh, what we see is that doing things like marching students to class in the cafeteria in straight lines and monitoring them with every move is is seen as insulting and they do act out in response to it. It's almost as though, you know, if you're going to treat me like this, I'm going to act like a child. Teach students instead how to monitor themselves so that they can learn what they need to do to maintain a civil learning atmosphere and move about the building uh, without disruption. Although it's fine to correct students' behavior, the goal is to build autonomy, not dependence. For example, if chaos erupts when a visitor enters the room, suspend the lesson for a moment and discuss solutions to the problem. Have the class practice those constructive responses, including asking a volunteer to cause a fake interruption while the class maintains focus on the lesson. If students don't have the necessary supplies for a day's lesson, help them determine how they can continue their work until they get the necessary <laughs> supplies, instead of simply letting them off with a take the zero. Um, or giving them a pencil. 
For adults and middle schoolers alike, self-efficacy aids transition. A fifth consideration for transitioning students into the middle grades is building hope. Students do better with a clear picture of what to expect, advice on how to handle potential issues, and assurance they will be okay. As we said earlier in the uh, opening portion of this PD, information and relationships is what this transitions is all about. Knowing what to expect and having somebody there on the other side to support me. Academic grades really should only report what's in the curriculum. When teachers can separate impulsive, immature behavior from academics, there's hope for students. In other words, with this age group, the way they behave should not figure in to their grade unless, of course, that behavior is keeping them from getting their work done. They need to be graded on their academics and not really on their behavior. And we do have in our district the citizenship grade, which is used for that reason. In terms of building hope, it's interesting to think that the only reason students raise their hands to answer a question or turn in assignments or participate in the world is because there's hope for a positive outcome. Without hope, a child will throw down the ball and go home. And we can't teach a child who is not physically or emotionally present. So we need to allow that child to have hope every day. And it's not a syrupy greeting card sentiment, it's visceral. If we could hear the thoughts of the students as they're going up and down the hall, which is a scary thought in and of itself, I think that what we might hear most is worry and stress and anxiety about whether someone is going to talk to them today or whether they're going to get um, teased or that the grade that they just got on a test was going to bring down the hammer at home. All of that is, is a lot for an uh, adolescent to deal with. And they want to be able to have hope that when they walk through the threshold to your classroom that they can maybe have some success, that there can be a successful outcome regardless of all of the stress and, and fear that's swirling around them in general. Students do better when they have a clear picture of what to expect, advice on how to handle potential issues, and assurance that they will be okay. And this hope has a real effect on school performance and achievement. So, for example, when students are late for class, they should expect a teacher response that preserves their dignity rather than demeans them in front of others, or they won't come into the class. If a student struggles to control impulsive behavior, as many of our students do, both those with and without IEPs for that type of impulse control, it's important for them to understand that their teacher understands that they're having a bad moment or a bad day and that there will be a chance to rebuild that trust that may have been lost during that class period. We often see that students can be absolutely horrendous uh, one day and then come back the next day as though we are their best friends and they can't wait to get started. That's just sort of a, a little insight into the role of hope in the adolescent mind. Pretending like it never happened and bouncing in there and giving the teacher a hug they're hopeful that that'll lead to, to success for that day. And uh, that hope is, is really what keeps them going in the face of so much stress and anxiety at that point in their lives. So as we wrap up this section on middle school uh, transitions and things that are particularly important to understand about middle schoolers as we design transitions to support them, we have some uh, some suggestions from the state. Give these a try. 
And I know a lot of buildings already do this. I've been involved in, in some of these activities, for instance, inviting incoming students, your incoming sixth graders, to begin school a half or a full day earlier than returning students. Um, I believe that this is a part of the district-wide transition plan in, uh, in the high schools. Providing practice opportunities before the transition. You might have students uh, come visit for a day to practice walking their schedule, to practice finding the lunchroom, pra practice finding the gym, um, do a little scavenger hunt where they explore the building and things like that. Having schedules ready for students has often been a challenge for us, but it's really supportive to give a student their schedule before the first day of school so that they can think it through, uh, maybe a map of the school so they could walk it through if they could see what rooms they're going to, talk to, to some friends to see which classes they might have in common. That can be a, a very supportive piece of information that can be provided ahead of time. And remember, transitions, the key to transitions are information so that you know what's coming and relationships so that you know someone on the other side who's there to support you. One little anecdote that was part of the original training for transitions was the idea of um, the lock and the locker, which I know as adults many of us still have nightmares about, so obviously it was a big part of our transition <laughs> stress. Uh, there are districts in which they take a locker door or uh, take locks to the elementary schools before the in the last few months of schools and let students practicing opening and closing the locks as much as they want for at least a week and they might if if the doors of their current lockers allow actually attach a lock and when they surveyed students to see what was helpful and what was not helpful in this study this lock activity ranked as one of the most helpful experiences in the student survey and had it been done for me, I would not to this day be having dreams about forgetting my locker combination. Another activity that, that some uh, schools do, and, and often in smaller districts, is have the uh, teacher who had the child the previous year provide the receiving teacher on the other end with some sort of general synopsis of, of the child's strengths, weaknesses, what works for them, um, little insights into their personality that might help the uh, new teacher reach them more quickly and efficiently, maybe some specific likes or dislikes. Uh, this can always be a little bit um, of a two-edged sword because we really don't want to uh, poison the well. We don't want to send, oh, you have better watch out for this one because we know that that can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if there were maybe uh, a more objective way of doing this perhaps on a form where you list things that you know about the student most current phone number could be very useful and have that in some way find its way to the next uh, teacher I know that when again I keep using my own kids but they had a tough transition from one elementary to another in the same district but the thing that helped my ten-year-old the most was the knowledge that her fourth grade teacher knew her fifth grade teacher and had talked to him about her and he was a real jokester so he said oh you know I told you all about your not being organized and they laughed about it but that eased her um, fears a lot and when she got to the fifth grade uh, teacher that teacher oh you know oh you're Julia and that just made her feel you know, you could literally see the stress melt off of her that somebody on the other side knew about her and was there to support her. Another thing that um, element or that uh, works is to send a letter of welcome to incoming students, a letter of congratulation as they rise to middle school for for them to get on their last day of elementary, um, a school in Alabama. Um, Drake Middle does this every year and the letters are dire addressed directly to each child and include students uh, team assignments and the dates of their summer camp session and transition programs so they actually receive a 
a, a mailing addressed to them during school that they can open and there's a sense of accomplishment and excitement that goes along with that simple, simple transition um, procedure. So as we wrap up here, uh, the middle school section of, of the Transitions PD, all this to really create an awareness that transitions are crucial and often overlooked elements that affect student success both academically and emotionally as they go through uh, the schooling experience K-12 that each of the different grade spans has its own unique transition needs as students change developmentally and that two keys that that work regardless of where they are in this continuum are information and relationships and in the early years that information going to the parent uh, and suggestions about how to help their preschooler transition. So middle school students need support in a lot of ways and in this presentation we talked about belonging empathizing and that means coming from the teachers empathizing with their developmental and emotional stage understanding focusing on the positive and building hope I hope this is useful to you as you think about and eventually design your own transition plan for middle grades